So good afternoon, everyone, uh, at our energy talk concerning the re realization of the urban smart DC microgrid in a real urban context. My name is Miro Holsens. I work at the intermunicipal company Leedal, uh, located in the northwest of uh, Belgium. And today I will be taking you with me to our region and more precisely to the site where we, together with our six partners, uh, are working on the European project resource. Um, Last year, in June, uh, the resource project has been selected by the European Commission uh, within the EU programme UIA, uh, which stands for Urban Innovative Actions. Together with the province of West Flanders, the municipality of Zwevegem, Rescope.eu, Flux50, Vito and the University of Ghent, we have been rolling out the project during the past 15 months and will be continuing uh, the project until June 2023. 20, uh, um, resourced, uh, the ultimate aim of the project of resource is to introduce a mid-scale and self-sufficient renewable smart grid in an urban environment, uh, which you can see on the picture um, uh, on the slide, based on a circular economy strategies like repurposing and more sufficient use of materials. The electricity produced on-site will also be used on-site by the users. That's the ultimate aim of uh, the project of resource. Now, this urban environment, uh, which I mentioned before, um, we are talking about uh, is listed uh, is a listed Transo uh, power plant situated in the municipality of Zwevegem. Uh, Transfer has been an active power plant uh, in the 20th century, century and has been bought by the municipality in the early uh, 2000s. Since 2004, the municipality of Zwevegem, uh, the intermunicipal company Leeral and the province of West Flanders uh, are working together on a structural basis to renovate and redevelop the Transvo site. This location uh, is a perfect setting for the project because of its historical link with electricity production, uh, but also because of uh, the multi-user development. Uh, Transfer already hosts uh, nowadays, but will host an even larger range of different functions in the future. Um, there are uh, there are offices, residential buildings, uh, apartment adve adventurous uh, ad activities. There is a climbing hall, event space, catering facilities, and uh, and so on. So, in other words, Transfer uh, can be, can be described as and really functions as a village within a village. Um, there are three main uh, aspects that are essential for the resource uh, project. Um, with the realization of a smart grid with DC backbone, we are increasing the share of uh, renewable energy in a most energy efficient way. So energy efficiency is a, 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 of, of great importance uh, within this project. Um, Nevertheless, we all know that the energy transition is material intensive and that the growth of re uh, renewable energy systems means an increased demand uh, for raw materials. It therefore is also an ambition of this project to make investments in renewable energy more sustainable and design a circular smart grid concept and blueprint based on the circular principles. For example, uh, such a circular principle can be a higher adoption of certified circular uh, products. Also, the choice for a DC grid uh, is in this project both uh, the consequence of the quest uh, for material efficiency as uh, a consequence of our quest for energy efficiency. Thirdly, uh, the project means uh, to enable to share the produced electricity directly with the users on site. Um, and this will be enabled uh, by the establishment of an energy community on uh, the site of Transvo. Um, this infographic uh, clarifies how we translated these ambitions uh, in the smart grid setup uh, of Transvo. There are more ambitions in the project, of course, uh, but these are the key uh, ambitions of, um, of the project. So, uh, resource, resource aims for a bundled production uh, and storage of electricity at district level. Uh, the production of electricity has been indicated in orange on the infographic. Uh, so, you can see um, at first, uh, at the left uh, bottom, you see um, a combined heat power system. We are still investigating the opportunities uh, of this uh, CHP. Um, what is uh, um, a certainty at, uh, uh, as of today um, that there will be solar panels 
uh, on several roofs on the site. Uh, and more specifically, there will be a car park uh, covered with uh, solar panels too. Um, thirdly, you see the mid-sized wind turbine uh, and also this wind turbine will be installed uh, next year at the site. Um, on the right side of the infographic, you see the green uh, symbols. These green symbols indicate the storage uh, which will be installed on site. Um, we talk about flywheel storage, uh, pumped water storage, hydrogen, uh, but mainly um, we talk about second life battery systems. Um, those production and storage infrastructures, infrastructures will be connected to the DC grid. Uh, via one DC AC inverter, the households, the offices, all the dwellings on site uh, will be provided directly by the energy produced um, on the site of Transvo. But to be able to use this electricity on site, to be able to share the produced elec electricity, we have to link the setup of the smart grid with uh, the establishment of um, an energy community. And that's what you see around the infographic. Um, you see the box, uh, so we need an energy community to be able to share these um, uh, locally produced electric electricity. Um, now, the last year, the last 15 months, we have been working towards the implementation of this concept. Um, and we have to be, we have to be honest, we are experiencing some difficulties. Um, a successful implementation depends on three uh, pillars. Uh, we have the technical, the financial, and the legal feasibility of the concept. Um, when we look from a technical point of view, we don't see um, very much issues. There are, uh, in fact, there are no problems uh, with the technical uh, plan of the concept. However, and unfortunately, uh, the financial and the legal feasibility of this concept has been more challenging. Um, at this point, there are no legal concepts that allow a financially interesting project for the users while maintaining the initial technical plan. Uh, so this means that in the end, the technical plan will probably have to be adjusted to a less efficient variant to be able to comply with the legal and financial frameworks. Um, so this triangle of technical, financial, legal pillars, this triangle has turned out to be a very difficult exercise. It's very challenging uh, to fulfill. Uh, and we are still investigating, uh, on today we are still investigating the scenarios uh, where those three aspects are met and where we don't have to lose on uh, our energy efficiency. Um, Finally, uh, the implementation of the legal framework for energy communities will, will be spread at least uh, three years, uh, over three years uh, in Flanders. Um, and moreover, when we apply this framework, as we know it uh, today, uh, when we apply it to this project, it doesn't seem to improve our business case uh, significantly. Um, so we do have a technical plan. We want to realize this technical plan, but we are uh, bumping into financial and legal uh, constraints. Um, now, I realize there was a very short uh, introduction to the project and to the uh, obstacles we are experiencing uh, during the implementation. Um, and it isn't enough to be able to explain everything in detail now, but in, when you have, or if you have questions, please uh, ask them in our chat. Um, we are uh, continuing to a panel debate. Uh, we have um, two partners uh, with us today um, to answer your questions. So feel free um, to ask us anything, or if you are experiencing um, the same um, the same problems uh, in a similar project, uh, feel free to uh, to um, to uh, join the the panel and to. Uh, Tell us about them. Uh, I introduce you, Frederik Lux, uh, CEO of uh, Flux50, Dirk van Sintian, President of Rescope.eu, and Dominique van der Wiele, Energy Expert uh, at Leeral. And uh, I give the floor to Dominique right now. Thank you for this uh, great presentation and uh, stressful moments in the technical issues in the beginning. But thank you, everybody, for providing us the feedback that there were some technical issues. Let's hope it went better now. Uh, so it's a call for questions. Um, you want to learn something more about this project? We have great uh, experts around the table. I see we don't have any questions so far. So perhaps then I uh, address a question towards uh, Frederik. 
Um, concerning the, the smart grids, we, we, there's a lot of talking about smart grids already over more than a decade. Then we realized that there aren't a lot of smart grids implemented in Europe. And you could wonder why is it? Is it that because it's not a good solution or is it the energy sector that's not ready? And, and does the transfer side really uh, brings added value for, for the grids? What's, what's, what about smart grids do we, is, is this a good example? Well, actually, as uh, Meryl pointed out, the technology is there and it's already there for ages. And actually, our uh, energy system started as smart grids. Um, and it was only after the Second World War that we connected all those smart grids together and that we created a, a large smart grid uh, that we now call the boilerplate. And I would like to make there the, uh, let's say, the, the comparison with uh, Africa. Uh, where we have a lot of smart grids because there is nothing existing yet. So we can see that there the first thing is that they are creating smart grids and are operating on, on a smaller scale. If you take a look at, uh, at the European uh, context, uh, we can see that at least in Belgium we have uh, availability of electricity uh, for 99.9995% of the time. So the, the reason for having a smart grid apart from yeah, now the the fact that we need to go from a centralized to a decentralized system, the, the, the reason is, is far less uh, urgent or seems to be far less urgent as what we see, for example, in an African context. This is also the reason why the first smart grids that we see appear in the European context are the energy islands, where you have a, a system which is loosely connected to the, to the mainland grid, where the business case of, of being not connected or loosely connected to that main grid is, uh, is less uh, stringent. Uh, so all our legislation, all our tarification, all our systems are based on that uh, boilerplate approach where we are all uh, yeah, delivered in a centralized way. Uh, so what we really need to enable um, smart grids and to have a decentralized system is an entire uh, regime change, a systemic change, which is uh, always very difficult to, to achieve important role in the energy transition with, with all these extra heat pumps, electric vehicles, yeah. um, decentralized production, could they play a significant role in urban environments to make uh, the energy transition more feasible and, and cheaper? In small scale uh, approaches, uh, as what we are now going to, uh, we will need energy sharing, we will need to uh, create new business concepts which allow that renewable energy that is typically produced quite uh, decentralized when you look at solar panels and, and onshore wind uh, that need to be consumed as, as, as close as possible to uh, the place where it is produced. We will need those concepts of energy sharing. But of course, it's as I said, it's, a, it's an entire different way of looking at things uh, compared to the, at this moment, very centralized way of, of planning uh, a grid. Uh, and a centralized way of planning is, of course, far easier uh, compared to turning to a democracy where everybody needs to, to work together and to, to, to cooperate in order to create that, uh, that well-functioning grid. I hear you talk about decentralized organization, citizen participation, the concept of energy sharing. Makes us think, of course, about the EU directives uh, around energy communities, uh, bringing the energy back to the citizens and let uh, citizens work together. And here, I think at the transfer side, it was shown it's the heritage side. It's not easy for all uh, end users to have their own uh, energy production. Um, um, installations. So here, uh, the smart grid is used to, to have uh, shared installations. And that was made possible by the EU directives uh, around energy communities. But there were a lot of expectations around it. And, and perhaps there were expectations that this could be a, a good solution that would offer uh, a new uh, framework and good solutions uh, to realize uh, this type of uh, energy sharing on the transfer side. 
which seems to be in practice a little bit more difficult. Uh, perhaps, Dirk, you can, you can shed your light uh, on that issue. What was the intention of EU uh, policymakers and, and how did it end in, in reality? Uh, can you have a view on that? Yes, of course. Uh, well, the, the new directives um, and especially the, the, the definitions on energy communities, um, they promised uh, uh, that projects like, like in, in, uh, we have in Zwevigem uh, on transfer, uh, that they would be able to, uh, to lead to uh, an, an interesting uh, situation for the, the participants. Um, like uh, also that, uh, for instance, in an apartment block, it would enable uh, the, the, the people living there to invest together in the solar panels on their roof and and and, uh, and have the electricity at home, like uh, people in their private homes. Uh, and and actually, the the uh, the directives they allow this, but uh, the directives also allow the member states to to. Uh, to, uh, to do a transposition that is uh, less favorable. Huh? So uh, what we see now in Flanders, as, as it turns out to be, just like Frederick already said, is that it uh, it won't allow uh, uh, inhabitants of a, an apartment block to share the electricity because they will only be able to share the small part of the, I, the small, it's getting bigger now with the high prices, but the part of the electricity and not the, the all the uh, taxes and levies uh, we 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 have in in uh, Flanders. Um, so uh, yeah, so the, the Europe allows a lot of things, but it's up to the member states to to uh, to implement it and. Uh, we try to have an overview of how this is going on as a federation, and uh, uh, we are publishing a, a sort of transposition tracker. Uh, so far, it's only about the definitions, and, and that seems okay in Flanders and in the rest of Belgium. But it is the ministerial decisions and, and also the decisions of the regulator which, which uh, make it more or less fa favorable for uh, participants in a project like uh, we have on transfer. So, um, yeah. I see some questions coming in, in, in the chat. Um, perhaps a question for Friedrich. What's the advantage to make a smart grid on DC rather than on AC? What's, what's, what's the thing about DC? Well, the, the fact is that uh, all the production devices, uh, whether it's windmills or uh, photovoltaics are working on DC um, and also all storage devices that we have at this moment, uh, batteries that are DC devices. So whenever we make a conversion from AC, from DC to AC and from AC back to DC, we are losing some efficiency. It's not that dramatic. It's a efficiency of 95, 97%. Uh, but anyway, when you do a lot of those conversions, you, you typically lose a lot of energy when it comes to energy efficiency. If you can work directly from DC and, and keep on working on a decent DC level, uh, it's uh, more efficient and also requires, from a material point of view, uh, less converters, and so less uh, material, less silicon, and, and that kind of things. So also, we would say. Could say that the BC grid is a small step towards more circular energy system. It is, it is, and actually the reason uh, the DC battle or the AC versus DC battle was uh, was won uh, a century ago, or more, somewhat more than a century ago, was because of safety. So uh, AC uh, type of uh, of current is uh, easier to to break. So from a safety point of view, uh, it's, it's so you can have the circuit breakers that we have now, uh, but this is technology. The uh, technology is, is taking that uh, that reasoning for going, turning to uh, the AC uh, that has vanished. So at this moment, we can create uh, DC voltage lines that are as uh, safe as uh, as AC lines. And when you take a look at uh, the real uh, high power transfer from, for example, windmills, offshore windmills, and those kinds of, of things. 
those are high voltage DC at this moment, they're not longer AC voltage. Okay, there's also a question concerning the engagement of uh, citizens in energy communities. I think so far it's just implemented, so I think it's hard to find to have a clear answers on that. But there can you give us an indication of what kind of incentives would be needed to motivate citizens to, to, to take part in this type of energy systems? What is the advantage? And what could motivate them uh, to take part in a shared uh, solar PV or battery system? Well, first of all, I want to st to say that um, energy communities is not something new. So uh, they have been around since the electrification of, of Europe. Uh, some of the members of our federation are more than a century old. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, I'm also a member of EcoPower, which is a fairly large energy cooperative. Uh, it has a legal entity of a cooperative. And we have 60,000 members in, in Flanders. Uh. So it was also the, the idea, the, the intention of the European Commission of Europe to give all these uh, initiatives, existing initiatives, a definition. And so, um, and why do people engage? Yeah? Uh, if I look at my own cooperative, well, we we uh, we give citizens uh, the chance to participate in production of renewable energy in their own country, and. They can do it from for 250 euro, for instance, to start with. It's one share, uh, and for 250 euro, they co-produce with all the others uh, the, the, all the green electricity they need. Yeah? So it is cheaper to uh, to participate in an energy community than to do it yourself on your your roof. Yeah? So uh, so th it's also a, a way to to allow people with with uh, less income to participate in the energy transition. So in our case, we also provide them with electricity at normally it's at a lower price than, than, than the other market players because we don't take profit. Huh? So that's also one of the elements in the energy communities. It's it's something where profit is not the aim, but the aim is to, to uh, provide them with green electricity or green energy at the lowest possible price. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the interesting discussion. I think you say the energy transition can be cheaper uh, if the, the potential of energy communities will be fully in, uh, developed. I see some uh, interesting questions and discussions uh, popping up. Uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, close down this session. We need to go to the next session. So I'd like to thank uh, Milo Olsens for the interesting presentation and the, the two experts, uh, Friedrich and Dick, uh, to give their view on a certain on a few issues. Perhaps we'll get in touch uh, to answer the remaining questions. And please don't hesitate to uh, to send an email if you have any other uh, questions or um, or remarks you would uh, have or shine your light on. Thank you all for uh, joining uh, this energy talk. I hope you enjoyed the energy week and please um, yeah, go to your uh, next session and uh, enjoy your next session. Thank you.